Now, what was the process like recording that album? The, 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 the Edge of the Mind is, uh, is, a, is a great, uh, let's say, a, a, the, the pinnacle of contemporary <laughs> jazz writing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank a you. A pinnacle? I'll, I'll, uh, it's a great record. I'll take it. Um, I'll take it. Uh, yeah, that record, we were really proud of that record. Um, we recorded at Systems 2 in Brooklyn with Michael mm-hmm. Marciano as our engineer, who's uh, just an absolutely genius engineer. And it was it was a two-day experience to record. And I'll say that, uh, well, John McNeil, I should add, was our sort of producer for that uh-huh. record. He sat in the booth and was giving us the uh, objective feedback that we needed. I'm sure he to, was objective. to make everything work. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well he was he was fantastic. <laughs> and so you know it was it was a tremendous experience. The the one thing that really stands out from the recording was John Hollenbeck's infinite wisdom and experience. Mm-hmm. Because he literally played with a metronome on silent at his side the whole time so that when we had to do an alternate take, when we had to come back to a tune, redo a section, whatever it was, he was pretty much guaranteed to be at the same tempo so that when we went back in the editing process, we had very, very few issues uh, piecing things together. It was really a great, great addition. Sure. And that's not easy to do to keep the fluidity of a jazz group and the spontaneity of it and still be looking down at the metronome, the light on the metronome going the whole time. That's a tricky move. Yeah, I don't know how he did it. He's an absolute monster player. Wow. Genius musician. Now, there's the, the, I think the nature of that uh, recording too has a way about it, which is it feels to me very improvisational. And yet it's very complex orchestration and composition and arranging. I mean, the whole thing is super tight, and yet at the same time, it has a, a breathing to it that is, it doesn't feel like it's a stiff, let's play the measure, you know, measures as they go. Is there any secret to that? I think maybe one of the best examples is in, is it, it might be, um, uh, bre- uh, what is, what's the tune? Break. Um, breaking Point? Breaking Point, exactly, which I think may speak to the, what you're talking about is that Bob Brookmeyer <laughs> exercise, isn't it? It's absolutely speaking to that. In fact, that tune uh, is left over from the first, I think, year that I studied with him. Hmm. So that tune was a very specific exercise in that concept of taking a linear intervallic structure and turning it vertically to create the harmony of the piece. Interesting. So it actually, its original name was Modular Piece Number 2, <laughs> because it was the second piece I wrote for him with that system in mind, um, and then I later changed it to a, a more, a classier title. Yeah, yeah, Breaking Point. But, it, or, but it's or, definitely, or it definitely speaks to the concept of, of taking a singular motive and pushing it as far as you can. Sure. So it's great that you hear it that way. Uh, that's, that's, you know, a, a huge compliment, because... We were trying to consciously integrate improvisation into the compositional process Mm -hmm. rather than the more traditional approach of having composition, a section of improvisation back to the composition. Sure. We wanted there to be a seamlessness. And so what I did to try to achieve that was to, in a couple of our tunes, start the soloist from a point of composition. So Edge of the Window is probably the best example that I can think of where the melodic line morphs directly into a composed solo line, which morphs directly into an improvised solo. So the soloist actually begins his solo as a compositional layer within the piece. Wow. Wow. Okay. So if if you were to go back and listen to that piece and listen to John Bailey's solo, he's part of the small group that's that's playing the melody, and then what seems like more melody is actually a composed solo that I put in there for him to start him down the road of improvisation. So the the seamlessness between the melody of the tune, 
the beginning of the solo and what ultimately is improvised is hopefully completely blurred. Sure. And now is there a way is there a way you think about that with the rhythm section as well? Because I know that a lot of the time, that may be just a personnel thing where everybody's on it. But I think maybe an example of that is, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but in Breaking Point, there's a point where John Hollenbeck and um, Deanna, correct? Yes. Drop out for a little while. I forget who, I think it's a tenor solo on that. I, I'm not sure exactly who's playing. It, yeah, it is. It's Chris Bacchus playing a tenor solo with just himself and bass. Mm-hmm. And the, the bass player, Dave Ambrosio, is playing uh, a hemiola, essentially. So he's he's creating this unstable uh, meter, and Chris is blowing over top of it in a very fluid, organic way. And so the, the very strict sort of rhythm of the earlier part of the piece becomes, it's just gone, it evaporates. And we've got this very unstable groove that develops, and when Hollenbeck comes in, comes back in and when Deanna comes back in it's a it's a highly punctuated you know rhythmic ostinato that then is layered with horn players and takes us back to the original sort of vibe Mm -hmm. and was that planned that was a was that part of the that was in the piece that's part of the piece now there's another piece and I may be confused about this uh but there's another piece on the record someplace where wasn't there like a surprise like the rhythm section did something made a left turn all of a sudden and then you, you almost stopped the whole piece because you weren't sure what was going on yeah, that's funny that you remember that story. Uh, that was in Edge of the Window, and that was, um, I think it was, I think it was the John Bailey solo, or maybe it was Deanna's solo that's right after it. I forget which one it was at this point, but in the original concept of the piece, the solo section was still under the same groove as the earlier part of the piece. It was a straight eighths you know, um, rim click sort of, sort of vibe. And over the multiple takes, um, I don't know if it was the first or second take of the tune, they, the rhythm section just went a completely different direction and completely freed it up, basically dropped out and we're just playing colors. Mm -hmm. And it was a, it was a, it was a, a vibe we had never experimented with on previous gigs or rehearsals. We'd never discussed it. It just happened spontaneously. I'm sure, you know, the soloist inspired the rhythm section in some way to go that direction. And my my instinct was to stop because that's not what I expected to happen. Thankfully, I didn't because that was ultimately the take that we went with because it was such a great contrast to the rest of the piece. Uh, I would be, you know, supremely <laughs> remorseful had I not, uh, had we not recorded that that section sure and it's a bold move by the rhythm section when you're in a recording session to roll the dice and try something completely wild but i I think that may be it's not an easy thing to achieve that that balance between the improvisation and the composition where everything goes exactly as it's supposed to go with 17 people you can't be you know rolling the dice is a dangerous game a lot of the time but when it when it works out it's you know it's a big payoff (laughs) absolutely and that gets back to your your question earlier as to whether or not that seamlessness and the organic nature of the improvisation versus the composition was to do with the players. And this is exactly where you're right, because those players were mature enough and experienced enough in this type of music that they felt comfortable just going with the moment Mm -hmm. rather than feeling obligated to stick to the plan. And that's the, the beauty of that particular collection of players and the beauty of being able to work with the same players for an extended period of time. They get to know each other. Uh, we get to know them as composers. And so a lot of the music we wrote over that decade was geared towards a specific player in the band, much like Ellington would have done, mm-hmm. you know, where we get to know these players and we get to know their particular approach. And we think, oh, well, this they would sound great on this tune. Let's build in a solo for that particular player. And, you know, it's for me, what made that band magical was the the people playing that music and the way they approached it. Sure. And that's not an easy thing to do to be able to have the same people show up and or a relatively consistent lineup or, you know, keep something like that together. No, especially when they're working for lunch money. 